Dear students, uh, welcome very much to this invited lecture. I'm very happy to share with you some information that I hope is going to be useful. Uh, this maybe relates to your topic, but not directly. Um, we're going to continue to talk about cellulose, but a different form of uh, cellulose. And uh, I would like to offer this idea of 3D structure biofilms based on cellulose and their applications. My name is Orlando Rojas, and I am professor in uh, UBC in the departments of chemical and biomolecular engineering, as well as uh, chemistry and wood science. And there you can find my email, and I will be very happy to answer any questions, or if uh, you have any comments or suggestions, I um, will be very happy to read them. So, so far, probably you have learned that in paper making, the idea is to take uh, fibers from wood or from plants, to disperse them in equal suspension, and then to put them back together into a paper structure, as the one that you see on the far right. So this is, this is the idea of uh, divide and combine. Use fibers to split them, to divide them, and then to put them back together in a dry piece of paper. Likewise, uh, you will notice that uh, we add water in the process at the beginning, in the equal suspension, in the slurry, but then in the drying process, we take water out, and this is how the fibers bond together in the paper material. So uh, you already maybe are wondering why we do paper making in such a way, and to me, this is really a very unique process that, uh, as you can realize, has been around us for thousands of years, yet remains the same since the very beginning. Now, I would like to offer you the idea that there are other alternative processes that will be emerging in the future. And one of the reasons why we need to look into um, new ways of uh, processing cellulose is that uh, when it comes for us to make uh, complex shapes, maybe we require other types of efforts. Here we require some sort of magic, that's how I put it. But essentially, in packaging materials, in many other materials that we use in everyday life, we want to go beyond a single two-dimensional uh, paper. We would like to make uh, three-dimensional geometries. And I'm taking this excuse of uh, this uh, challenge to introduce in this class an example of uh, a different method for fabrication of cellulosic materials. Uh, I will call that method of fabrication biofabrication. And then I take the opportunity to introduce uh, this way by using um, bacteria as a means to produce cellulose that for all purposes, it's very similar to the one we find in plants, but maybe have some uh, unique aspects that I would like to maybe discuss with you. So welcome to cellulose produced from bacteria. Uh, bacterial cellulose that is again produced by a microorganism is what you see on the right. In a test tube, we have a culture medium. In that culture medium, we have a microorganism, and among the many microorganisms that exist around us, there is one that produce, or several one actually, several species that produce a pellicle close to the surface, uh, and that type of a micro microorganism we call cellulose produce producing uh, bacteria. That was discovered uh, early on. You can see by Brown. Um, later on, another Brown, in this case in the 70s in University of Texas, really did a lot of work studying the biosynthesis of this type of uh, cellulose that is derived or produced uh, by bacterial microorganisms. So it's a very interesting topic. Again, very different to what you've seen so far, what you have studied so far for cellulose derived from plants. But it's striking to me that in nature there are other sources for cellulose that includes not only plants but microorganisms and there are even animals that produce cellulose. So that's uh, very interesting. So let's focus now on cellulose produced from bacteria. And uh, here you see another example of uh, the pellicle that is formed. That pellicle is actually quite strong. 
you can separate the um, material from the culture medium, from the nutrients that you use in water for the microorganism to produce the uh, cellulose on top at the, let's say, air-water interface. And you may be wondering why the microorganism produce such, such a pellicle of cellulose. We will see later how the pellicle looks in, uh, uh, in the micro scale. But anyway, the main reason for the bacteria to produce cellulose has to do to the um, possibility for the microorganism to access the surface and in that way access air. Because those microorganisms that we are dealing with are aerobic and they use air and whatever we have in the culture medium, the nutrients, to biosynthesize, to produce cellulose. And the cellulose that is um, deposited as a pellicle on the surface have uh, different functions. One of those is to guard the microorganism from radiation, from UV radiation, to build a cage and to confine it so that it's also protected from uh, enemies. Uh, while at the same time, uh, that pellicle it allows still uh, diffusion of nutrients in and out so that we or so that microorganisms can produce uh, the material. On the left, you see a uh, table of uh, different microorganisms uh, that are known to produce uh, cellulose in the form of pellicles or fibers. So it's a very interesting and uh, actually quite extensive area of work. Let's go a little bit in deeper detail. Uh, how the bacterium looks. This is the top uh, figure that you see there. The uh, bacterium in this case produces cellulose as an image and you can uh, Google or go in YouTube and uh, search for bacterial cellulose and you will find very beautiful videos where you can actually see uh, the process for the microorganism to produce cellulose. And that cellulose is produced as you can visualize uh, in such a way that looks like a ribbon and it has some twisting and in the bottom you see a little bit more details uh, about that microstructure. So for all purposes, these um, ribbons of cellulose are highly pure and they are in the nano scale. You can see in the bottom the um, scale bar that tells us information about the size. And that that type of uh, process, um, uh, producing the ribbons that now I repeat in the top, will be assembled and forming a network that you see close to my video in the bottom. And after removal, removal of the nutrients and after cleaning the proteins derived from the microorganism, then you get a very whitish uh, material that is the one that uh, this person is holding in his hand. And those celluloses that you see here, we can call bacterial nanocellulose. So from now on, I will refer to BNC, that is bacterial nanocellulose. So it's a cellulose that is produced by mm, microorganisms, is in the nanoscale, and it differs from the fibers that we see in trees in the sense that this is pure cellulose. It's not a hollow structure as in fibers or, or in plant cells, but it's formed by ribbons. And the chemical composition is very much the same than the one that we see in plants. Now, my, uh, uh, my experience with bacterial cellulose started a long, long time ago with uh, some collaborators from a country, Medellin, uh, Colombia, in Colombia. Um, my friends there uh, were interested to look into microorganisms that they found in the fruit market in the city of Medellin and they found that in the vinegar or in the liquids that fermented from pineapple juices and other fruits they saw this uh, pellicle growing and that was identified as a bacterial cellulose producing cellulose and that microorganism has been recently named in this particular case with the name that you see there below the photo that is uh, Comagatai bacter medellinensis. And you can find more information in the website there in the bottom. This is an example of how 
from a daily experience, you can find products in nature that can be quite useful. And in the next slides, I will try to show you how we can use this type of uh, microorganisms to build new materials. So this is an example from, from my student, in this case in Finland, uh, who is handling one of these pellicles, as you can uh, visualize here, is actually quite strong. Uh, the cellulose that is produced by the bacteria makes a network uh, that holds a lot of water and even if it is uh, mainly water what you see there still it keeps uh, mechanical integrity and after removal of the protein then you can see how it turns a little bit uh, wider and this uh, material can be dry that's what you see on the right uh, that dry material makes a film that is extremely strong and later I will show uh, some uses for those films, including, for instance, uh, filtration processes. And again, this um, uh, piece of uh, sort of paper produced by uh, bacterial uh, microorganisms, bacterial cellulose, are shown in the bottom, where you can see how the paper has sidedness, meaning it's different. This uh, pellicle or this film of bacterial cellulose is different on one side from the other. On the, earth, on the earth side, you can see the SEM image on the left at the bottom square, and then on the right, that will be the medium size, that is, uh, side, pardon, sorry, the side where the bacterial cellulose film was produced. And there is a differentiation. Uh, in a way, funnily enough, similar to what you see in paper making, where paper is produced and there are two sides to paper, the uh, air side and the bottom felt side that are also different. Anyway, there is a lot to be say, said about uh, bacterial cellulose. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time in this slide, but just to say in the middle that uh, one can measure the yield of cellulose that is produced um, and that yield will depend on the pH of the medium. There is an optimum pH that you can see there, usually in the acidic side of pH. And the yield with time, as the microorganisms produce cellulose, will, uh, will produce more and more until some given time, in this case, roughly a week, where the yield more or less uh, reaches a plateau. So the more time you leave the microorganism to produce uh, cellulose, then the thicker the pellicle will be. And this cellulose that I have already introduced as very similar to plants are, uh, is a type of cellulose that is known to be very high degree of polymerization and very crystalline. And this is what we show with some data on the far right that we don't need to uh, discuss in detail. But just to say that this type of uh, cellulose is pure highly crystalline, high molecular weight. Now, let me turn our attention to the other issue that I had mentioned before, and that is biofabrication. So here the idea is, or the question is, can we use bacterial nanocellulose, BNC, to build objects, to build new structures? On the left, you see the uh, microorganisms, and on the right, you also then appreciate what I uh, here present as the microorganisms, but in a different dimension in our real world, right? So here we have uh, some construction workers that are expert builders, similar than the um, microorganism. So if you take either the microorganisms or the builders, provided we have a plan, like what you see here, a plan for a construction, and we use the building blocks. In this case, the building blocks would be these bricks, but in the case of uh, the microorganism would be the cellulose ribbons that I have introduced, then we can build a house. And that's exactly what the microorganisms now do, but in a different scale. So same situation in the biofabrication, we have the microorganisms producing in the culture medium with the help of air and the nutrients, uh, the microorganisms produce the pellicle and that goes to the air water interface because what I have indicated before, that is the aerobic uh, production in the system. Now, in biofabrication, we want to go beyond the idea of making pellicles or films at the surface of the culture medium. And then now, 
I introduced some way how we can control that to go beyond that uh, sort of uh, pellicle that I have introduced and see if we can do things like the ones that I um, presented and where I ask what can we do with cellulose beyond two-dimensional materials. So in this example, what we propose here in this budget fabrication is to have a solid support, a template or a mold that will be covered by uh, these particles, spherical particles that you see in the center. These are hydrophobic, meaning that they repel water. Then where you see the blue arrows, you can expect some entrapped air to be present. And then close to those particles, then we will have the culture medium on the left and the microorganisms that will use the air that is entrapped between the template and the particles. And that air will be used to produce our bricks, in this case, the um, bacterial cellulose. And from that, if we use a mold with a given shape, then we can produce a structures not, no longer in one or two dimensions, but actually in three dimensions, like the one that you see in the red background. We will go a little bit deeper into this. So these materials, uh, we can think as a way for us to direct the fabrication of cellulose-based uh, systems or structures that can be used for many different purposes. So really here, what I propose is the idea of making, in this particular case, biomedical devices that can be used for high-end applications, uh, exploiting this idea of directed assembly of cellulose produced by microorganisms using uh, the so-called biofabrication. And that's very important because it's a beautiful way how we integrate biology, synthetic biology, with uh, physics and material science. And I, to me, that can be, in some sense, some of the futuristic approaches to uh, producing the materials that we need um, uh, in high-end applications. So let me go back to the idea of the uh, spherical particles that we use to hydrophobize, to uh, bring some air to the system so that the microorganism can grow in any shape that we want. So we can think about this as an interfacial stabilization using hydrophobic guiding. Let me explain this in more detail. In number one, we have a droplet with the cultural medium that you can see there in the tip of the pipette. That's a cultural medium that we are depositing on a bed of hydrophobic particles. And because of the hydrophobicity, then the culture medium that is mostly water will roll up and produce a droplet on the bed of the particles that are hydrophobic. So we're going to get a droplet on the bed of the particles. Then if we wait for some time after some incubation, what is going to happen is that the culture medium inside that contains the microorganisms uh, will um, uh, undergo the production of uh, the cellulose by the microorganisms, and that cellulose will grow close to the hydrophobic particles. So at the end, what we will end up having is a capsule of bacterial cellulose after removal of the hydrophobic particles. So what you see on the far right is actually uh, a cellulose network that forms a capsule in three dimensions, like a sphere, and is uh, fully cohesive. You can find water inside and water outside. It's extremely strong. And is uh, again, a, a way for us to produce three-dimensional uh, materials. So how these uh, capsules will grow depends on the incubation time. And uh, in the figure that you see, uh, the main figure here, you see how with incubation time, the weight of the material that will grow will increase until you get some stabilization. And also you will appreciate that depending on the size of the droplet of the culture medium that we deposited on the surface, then you can have uh, larger or smaller particles. In all cases, what we're using is oxygen or air that is entrapped at the interface for the microorganisms to be able to undergo the aerobic process of producing the cellulose as a biofilm. 
So if we do a little bit of a different route and we take any other uh, mold with any shape, like in this case a cube, and in this particular case it's a plastic cube, and we add a little bit of acetone, and we add the hydrophobic particles, in this case Teflon uh, particles, and we let the acetone to evaporate, then in, on the walls of the mold, we're going to see what you see on the right, that is the uh, hydrophobic particles coating the inner walls of the container. And this is where we're going to uh, add the culture medium with the microorganisms so that the microorganism can have access to the oxygen that is entrapped between the walls of the mold and the hydrophobic particles. So by doing that, maybe uh, you can appreciate this a bit better uh, here in this slide. Uh, here we have uh, on the left some different molds um, where we have added water and then air will be entrapped between the solid material and the liquid, in this case uh, water, and this is what are called air plastrons. So pockets of air that are accessible to the liquid medium that is on top of it. And that, that's what you see on the right. In this case, we have the bacteria in yellow, water in blue, the hydrophobic surface in gray in the bottom, and in white, air that is entrapped, and that's the air that the microorganisms access to produce the cellulose at the interface. In this case, at the interface between the surface, the hydrophobic surface, and the water. So by doing, do, by doing, uh, by doing this, by waiting a little bit, then we're going to get a pellicle, a biofilm, or a network of cellulose inside the mold, and that will look, after separating the cellulose from the mold, will look like what you see on the far right. So now we have made a cubic, or sort of a rectangular, three-dimensional shape that is based on cellulose. Something that would be difficult to make with be uh, a typical two-dimensional papermaking processes, right? Uh, in this case, you can think on a box. In a box, we take a two-dimensional piece of paper and we fold it, and then we get a box. But in this case, it's a different type of box, seamless uh, box that is produced by microorganisms with some given applications that I will show later. So again, uh, uniform biofilm is formed. The thickness of that biofilm will depend on the time that you wait for it to be formed and it will depend on the access to oxygen. So if we print in a mold our face using 3D printing or any other technique and we run the same exercise, we put culture medium in the hydrophobic mold, we let the bacteria to grow cellulose, then we can use uh, the biofilm that is formed to produce uh, the negative of the material, uh, and that is the one that you see on the right. So now we have there a face of a person that is produced by the microorganisms. And if we continue further with this exercise, then you can imagine that that can be quite use useful for uh, other applications, for, issue, for instance, in tissue engineering or organ bioprinting, or simply just printing objects in three dimensions with complex structures that are based on pure cellulose. And this maybe is a different angle, perhaps, to what you have seen so far in the case of cellulose produced by um, regular plant-based fibers. It's an example just to illustrate uh, how these uh, materials in three dimensions um, fold the structure quite uh, well. Uh, in the left, we have a sort of a branch structure mimicking like the vessels. Uh, they are hollow, meaning that they are immersed in water. Inside, we have also water. And the structure can be quite interesting for given biomedical applications. Now, I will very quickly refer to other applications different than the ones I have shown so far related to biomedical field. Uh, in that case, uh, for instance, uh, vessel elements. Here, I would like to maybe introduce three examples um, shown here, encapsulation and release, separation, membranes, and affinity separation on the right. And I think these days, this is uh, quite um, uh, timely, uh, given what we're facing today related to um, 
toxic materials, viruses, and, and uh, uh, bacterial organisms that uh, perhaps we can separate by uh, given uh, approaches like the ones that I will present on the far right. So let me start with the insulation very briefly. We're not going to go in, in detail, but um, um, in the case of encapsulation, you can imagine that uh, these capsules that I have already introduced can be formed and they can be immersed in water. And if we take those capsules that contain water and are immersed in water, then we can prepare actually structures that are uh, a little bit more complex. In this particular case, it's quite actually easy to produce capsules inside capsules. In both cases, produced by microorganisms, they are all cellulose, but in this particular case, we're protecting the smaller capsules with the larger capsules. And that we can call multi-compartmentalization. Very interesting aspect in science and in industry that um, uh, if you search, you will find some opportunities for, for work in this area. So this is very unique and it's a way to produce cellulose-based materials in a completely different way than uh, um, the way we are used to so far. Those capsules can contain given elements. Uh, for instance, in this, in this case on the left, I show capsule that uh, contains water, but also it has some dye so that we can see uh, in yellow the material. And then that, that material that is inside that dye exposed in a given uh, medium can be then released or it can diffuse out. And in that way, we can have a drug release um, uh, in, as an example of a drug release uh, 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 material. Uh, here, just to show that that permeability of the capsules can be actually adjusted. And in this case, if we add alginate, it's a, a, a very important biopolymer. If we add alginate, you can see that the release of the material that is inside the capsule, by the way, it was dextran, that is uh, dye, um, it can be really reduced if we add alginate. So permeability quite nicely can be uh, adjusted by adding other components in the biofilm formation. Okay, let's very quickly look at another example of bacterial cellulose membranes that can be used for uh, separation in this case. And in this example that I will show, we will refer to size exclusion separation. In other words, this has to do with filtration. We have on the left the wet pellicle of bacterial cellulose that can be used as a film that can be used for filtration. That's what you see in the center. So we can uh, uh, produce membranes, in this case, bacterial cellulose membranes that will look like what we have in the center in green. And the porosity of those membranes can be controlled by modification during the grow of the cellulose or by post modification. Also the hydrophilicity, hydrophobicity of the membranes can be controlled. So it can be quite an opportunity for us to think about uh, this type of size exclusion element. As an example uh, of in situ modification, if we let the bacterial cellulose to produce the cellulose ribbons, the BNCs, this is what you see here. But if we do that in the presence of a, a polymer in the culture medium, in this case, uh, uh, I mentioned here PEG, polyethylene glycol with a given molecular weight, in this case 10,000, then the film that will be formed can be adjusted depending on the presence of this uh, molecule that we have added. So here we have the case of um, uh, incubation for five days, for seven days, and in the top arrow, or in the top, um, sorry, row, you can see how the pellicle or the biofilm or the membrane becomes more dense just by letting the bacterial cellulose to produce uh, more and more cellulose ribbons. In, in the bottom, you see exactly the same, but in the presence of the molecule that I mentioned, PEG, uh, after five days and after 10 days, and you can see here how the structure, the morphology of the membrane is, uh, is uh, changed. In the bottom right, by the way, uh, I show how the porosity can be also affected by solvent exchange. So we have now a much more open membrane. So quite nicely, we can control the porosity permeability of membranes. And those membranes based on bacterial cellulose can be used
for filtration. And that's what we have here is um, a cross flow filtration on the left at a given pressure. And on the right, you can see the um, transmembrane pressure, or in this case, the pure water flow, PWF, the amount of water in volume per unit area per unit time that will flow through the membrane at a given pressure. And you can see that depending on the membrane uh, morphology and permeability, then you can have different values. So this is just to show the capability for us to control uh, this type of um, uh, variables, such as the permeability, which is very important in filtration. Okay, so that, that has to do with uh, size exclusion. One last example is maybe combining um, three-dimensional structure in bacterial cellulose for another type of filtration, in this case, affinity biofiltration or bioseparation. So let me go over here. The process that is used for this is uh, very similar to what I have explained before. Uh, top left, you can imagine that we have a tube immersed in the culture medium. By the way, that's shown in the photo in the bottom. And access to oxygen allows for the bacteria to produce the bacterial nanocellulose that is in orange around the tube. And then if that tube is removed from the culture medium, then you can handle uh, that tube that is produced with your hands. That's what you see on the top right. And if we remove the protein, then we get a hollow tube like the ones that are handled with the tweezers that can be used as a membrane, but in this case, in the form of a tube or a tubular membrane. One little detail here is that in order for us to activate, to make more reactive uh, the cellulose that is produced, we did the incubation in the presence of a molecule called carboxymethyl cellulose. So that helps to bring to the system some uh, negative charges and those negative charges or negative groups, carboxylic groups, can be quite useful to modify the membrane. In this case, the tubular membrane that is produced. So it's a little detail uh, just to uh, highlight the fact that by playing with the cultural medium, we can make such type of modifications in this particular case to activate the membrane, to make it more reactive by adding CMC, carboxymethyl cellulose. And the membranes that are produced now uh, have the morphology that I show in, on the top. Here we have a cross section of the uh, tube on the left, the inner surface, on the right, the outer surface in the cross section. And you can see that there is some differentiation in the morphology of the tube inside and in the outside. And the main point here is that when we do the incubation, in this case, in the presence of the carboxymethyl cellulose, there will be some differentiation in the type of uh, ribbons of cellulose that are produced left and right but pretty much very similar system. So in other words, the CMC that is added to the cultural medium is not toxic to the microorganism. The microorganism can still produce the um, bacterial nanocellulose, the ribbons of the fibrils that, that, that you see. And these are the ones that we are assuming as a membrane, in this case, um, that, that is in the form of a tube. And that tube now is a hollow tube. I show this in the figure on the right. With given modifications, we don't need to be entertained on the details of the chemistry for such modifications, but very roughly, we modify the inner side of the tube with a given biomolecule that is shown in blue, like a Pac-Man in blue. And that uh, material is actually quite effective to bind, to absorb uh, a protein in this example, this particular example, will be the case of uh, human serum albumin, HSA. So if we run um, plasma uh, fluid through this membrane, if we flow it through the inner side of the membrane, or in this case tube, then the blue Pac-Man will be able to selectively bind HSA, but no other protein. So it's extremely selective. So this is very important in the medical field. And you can read in the bottom a little bit uh, uh, about why we want to do that. But at this point, 
the main issue that I want to highlight is the possibility of using these uh, bacterial cellulose membranes in the field of bioseparation. That is to remove in a very selective way biomolecules like HSA from human plasma. Okay, just to conclude, I will give some other details about other possible, possible uses for bacterial nanocellulose. So one of those here is to take those um, um, BNCs, those uh, fibrils that can be used in processes where we mix water, we mix uh, oils, for instance, and we create the so-called emulsions. So an emulsion droplet in the case of the left will be oil droplets dispersed in water and the bacterial nanocellulose that I have introduced will go to the surface of the droplets, stabilizing those droplets, uh, protecting the droplets, and from that applications such as the ones in the bottom for food and cosmetics will be very easy to perform. And this is very nice because bacterial nanocellulose is known to be biocompatible, uh, non-toxic, and safe. So it can actually be used uh, for us to eat. Bacterial nanocellulose is a food product. It can also be used in our bodies, in implants. Uh, so there are a lot of activity actually in the medical field. Um, another example is to take the bacterial nanocellulose, put it in water, that's what I show in the syringe on top, where it says extruder. Um, here we can use different types of uh, cellulose materials, but particular interest is BNC that is extruded in a coagulation bath. In that case, imagine that in the uh, um, syringe we have bacterial nanocellulose dispersed in water and is injected as a dispersion in a coagulation bath that contains water either with HCl, calcium chloride, or maybe also you can imagine that that coagulation bath is just simply an organic solvent like uh, maybe acetone or, or ethanol. So what is going to happen is that the bacterial nanocellulose or in general the cellulose ribbons will coagulate and will form a, a thread or a filament that you can collect. So to make this uh, more clearly, this is exactly a similar situation. We have a syringe, we have a coagulation bath, then a syringe extrudes the bacterial cellulose dispersion in the coagulation bath, and that dispersion then produces a filament in the coagulation process. That filament that you see now in the rollings um, will be collected as you see in the bottom right. So that was a very quick uh, video, but just to show an example of the things that we can do with this type of material. Uh, another example, maybe this is the final one, relates to 3D printing. 3D printing, of course, is a very common method nowadays that is used to create materials in, in three dimensions. And for that, bacterial cells can be really ideal to make uh, 3D structures via 3D printing. So I don't need to spend time here explaining the, all the different cases, but here you can appreciate these lattices or grids that are produced with different types of uh, celluloses, and the one in the center corresponds to uh, bacterial nanocellulose. In the wet state, that is the green photos that you see on the top, but also after drying, uh, the grids after drying, after removal of water, that's what you see in the bottom.
Um, so all this that we have called biofabrication is something that actually um, has been exploited by many different uh, persons, organizations. And in this particular case, if you go to this uh, website, you will see some ideas of, um, of uh, somebody clever that put a cultural medium in the bath that you see uh, on the left. And then uh, that person was able to collect the pellicle that is produced from bacterial cellulose, as you see on, uh, on the right. And that you can imagine, you can use this for, for making wearables, materials, and, and there are some artists and designers that have come up with the idea of using bacterial cellulose uh, biofilms or membranes, as I have discussed, to make uh, clothing. So quite interesting ideas are developing and in development in this area. The final example where we can think about uh, different experiences that go beyond the ones that we're used to is this example that I want to, to illustrate. This in particular was a, um, a, a composer, a music composer that you see on the right, who worked with us together to produce these uh, films of bacterial cellulose that can be used actually as a um, membrane for speakers. That's what you see on the bottom left. Sound propagation is very interesting for these uh, biofilms of cellulose. And then if we do, um, or if we make a structure that we can use as a virtual reality experience, then we can have a material that we can put around our heads where we can listen to sound and maybe put some lighting. So very interesting experiences as far as how we can use these uh, cellulose membranes to manage sound and light, in this case, in virtual reality applications. So I think this is all I wanted to, to share with you. Uh, we can maybe summarize uh, the, this talk by saying that um, my main objective was to introduce to you another way for us to produce cellulose-based materials beyond the ones that we produce from plants in this case, by using microorganisms, and this open us, this open um, us to some idea, uh, open some ideas about the potential of biofabrication, the potential of merging biology, synthetic biology, in uh, areas of technology and engineering. So I hope you uh, enjoy my presentation, and if you have any question, please uh, uh, don't hesitate to contact me by using the email that I introduced in the first slide. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, coming and listening to this uh, lecture.